Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Michaela Osley. I work for Tattered Cover Bookstore, and I want to say thank you. First and foremost, that's the biggest thing and the most important for that I have to say is thank you for joining us this evening. Tattered Cover is a local independent bookstore in located in the Denver metro area in Colorado. Uh, we have four locations, and we have been around for 50 years now, which is quite amazing. So we would not be here the last 50, the last year without your support. We know we can't gather communally in in person, but the fact that we're able to be here virtually and that you are a part of our virtual community means the world to us. So thank you so much. If you live in the Denver metro area, you can come visit one of our four stores. Actually, it's three right now as we are in the middle of moving our Lodo location to McGregor Square, which we're very excited about, and that's going to open in mid-May. And then even more so, which was announced yesterday, we have our exclusive Tattered Cover Children's store that is going to be selling children's books only, and that's going to be opening in Stanley Marketplace later in May, early June as well. So we're very excited. Lots of awesome things happening here. Uh, and you can keep up to date with all of that if you follow us on social media, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and follow a, uh, subscribe to our newsletter, email newsletter as well. And a great place to figure out what's coming up next is also tatteredcover.com slash event, uh, where you can find out all of our upcoming events that we have uh, virtual, uh, you know, maybe when we get into the future, dabbling in some in-person events too. We definitely want to see your lovely faces. But you can come in and shop with us um, either in person if you're in the area, as long as you're wearing your mask over your mouth and your nose, you can come browse for about 90 minutes or so. Or as always, you can always shop online with us at tatter tatteredcover.com, excuse me. Um, but you know, there's nothing quite there like getting to smell the books and be in the bookstore. So we always encourage that if you can. The other thing we wanna let you know is that closed captioning is enabled for this video, should you want it or need it. There's a black bar down at the bottom of the screen with a button labeled CC on it. If you click that button, closed captioning is enabled for those who want it or need it. And now I, I'm so excited to talk about this event. Um, it was a really exciting book that we have here. And you know, we can't thank you enough again. We wouldn't be able to bring amazing authors like the one we have tonight for you. We're celebrating uh, Alec McGillis um, and his new book, Fulfillment. He's gonna be in conversation tonight with Nicholas Riccardi. And Nicholas is a political reporter in the US West covering the electorate and AP vote cast. He covered the 2012 and 2016 presidential campaigns from Denver. He's a former national reporter for the Los Angeles Times. And our author of the hour is Alec McGillis, a senior reporter from Pro for ProPublica, excuse me, and the recipient of a George Polk Award, the Toner Prize for Excellence in Political Reporting, and other honors. He worked previously at the Washington Post, the Baltimore Sun, and the New Republic. And his journalism has appeared in the New York Times Magazine, the New Yorker, and the Atlantic, uh, and the Atlantic, and other publications. His ProPublica reporting on Dayton, Ohio, was the basis of a peep. PBS frontline documentary about the city. He's the author of The Cynic, a, 24, a 2014 biography of Mitch McConnell. He's a native of Pittsfield, Massachusetts and lives in Baltimore. And like I said, today we are celebrating his book, Fulfillment, Winning and Losing in One Click America. And it is my pleasure to welcome both Nick and our author tonight, Alec McGillis. And we're gonna have them join me on Zoom here with their videos and microphones. Perfect. There's Nick. Hello. <laughs> Hello. And Alec. Hi. Pleasure to have you both here. Thank you so much. I want to remind our viewers that we are going to do a Q&A. So the screen that you're watching us on has a chat next to it that some of you have already been active in. So thank you for that. Um, and that's where you'll ask your questions after these gentlemen are done talking. But Alec, I uh, believe you have something for us and I'm going to let you take it away. All right. Well, thank you so much. Um, Thanks so much to, to Tattered Cover for organizing this. Thanks so much for, for Nick, to Nick for joining me. Um, I've admired Nick's insights for many years now, and I was really, really excited that he was able to, to come join tonight. And so grateful to the store um, for doing this. I'm, I'm very sorry on this, in this whole, my, sort of my virtual tour these last few weeks, not to be able to be in places um, because this book is about places. It's about places all across the country. And so it's unfortunate that I don't get to actually be out in them. Um, but this is certainly um, something some, way better than nothing. And I'm very grateful for it. And I'm hoping that I can come out maybe for the paperback uh, tour next winter 
and actually get out and, and meet people. Um, so I'm just going to say a few words at the outset um, about this book, and and then I'm going to read something short, actually a passage from uh, that's set in in the Denver area. Um, this book actually started and it begins in the Denver area, so it's really cool to be able to be at the tattered cover this evening. This book is um, is about Amazon, but it's also about much more than Amazon. It began actually as a book about regional inequality in America, um, an issue that I've, a topic that I've been kind of fixated on for more than a decade now as a national national political reporter going around the country, going starting back in like the Great Recession, basically the early Obama years, and, and just being struck when I went around the country as a reporter, just seeing just all these really struggling uh, cities and, and towns that were you know, in the Midwest and Appalachia and elsewhere that remind me quite a bit of my hometown of, of Pittsfield, Mass, where I actually am tonight. Um, and, and just and being, being struck by their struggles and, and, the, and the sort of sense, the sense in all of them that they've been kind of passed by. And then going back to Washington as a political reporter and in Washington, DC, where I was based at the Washington Post and just again, being overwhelmed by the prosperity and, and complacency and sort of disconnect there um, from what was happening out around the country because DC was only getting wealthier in those years. And so I wanted to write about this and I settled on, um, after Trump got elected, I thought I really need to write about it because the political costs of, of those disparities became very clear after that election. And I decided, finally decided to use Amazon as the frame through which to tell this story of disparity um, for two quick, two reasons. One, the company is, so, company is so ubiquitous now that it's just a handy thread to take you around the country because it's everywhere and it, um, in very different ways. And so it's just, it's, it's a very good metaphor in a sense for what, what we're becoming as a country. But then it's also a good frame because it is, uh, it is itself contributing to, to regional disparities. Uh, the, we can talk about this more later, but put it simply, regional concentration of wealth is very linked to economic concentration in various sectors of our economy. So as, as our, the various tech giants get so, become so dominant um, and draw us more and more of the sort of wealth and prosperity and business activity in the country into the places where, where they're based, um, you, 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 it, it helps to sort of exacerbate these disparities. So that, that was the, basically the theory of the case. And that was the frame I set out with to tell the story. And the story begins in, uh, in the Denver area. Uh, I, as the pandemic got going last year, I knew that I, of course, had to work the pandemic into the book. And I knew that the pandemic was actually going to exacerbate a lot of the um, problems that the book describes. And it had, and it did. And the place I chose to start the story of the pandemic is in the Denver area. So I'm gonna read just a couple pages and then we'll, we'll open to Q and A. This is from the introduction of the book, which is called The Basement. Hector Torres was living in the basement because his wife told him to. He had done nothing wrong, committed no matrimonial transgression. He simply worked at the wrong place. The irony of it was he had taken the job at his wife's urging. He had spent 11 years unemployed ever since losing his 170,000 per year tech industry job during the Great Recession. He had fallen into despondency and depression, the trough of the 50 something person cast aside in an industry that privileged youth. The family had gotten by on the income of his wife, Flora, who sold training sessions for medical diagnostic equipment. But they eventually had to downsize to a smaller house in the Denver suburb where they had moved after, after fleeing their $5,500 monthly, monthly mortgage in the Bay Area in 2006. Eventually, Laura had issued an ultimatum. If Hector didn't get a job, he couldn't stay. So he had left moving back with his family, Central American immigrants who had settled in California decades earlier. He lived with his older sister's family in an exurb of San Francisco. If he left the house, he had to be home by 8.30 every night so as not to disturb his brother-in-law who woke at 4.30 every morning for his long drive to Silicon Valley, making him one of the more than 120,000 Bay Area workers who commuted more than three hours every day. After five months of this, Hector had accepted Laura's offer to return on the condition that he get a job which he finally did half a year later in June of 2019. He was driving by the warehouse one day and saw a sign that they were hiring and pulled over and asked about it. And they said he could start the next day. 
He worked overnights, four nights a week, typically from 7.15 p.m. to 7.15 a.m. He worked all over the warehouse, stacking boxes in outbound trailers, loading pallets, packages onto pallets, and inducting envelopes and packages, which meant standing at the conveyor belts for the entire shift. There were no chairs on the warehouse floor and transferring hundreds of items per hour from one carousel to another while turning them right side up so that scanners could read their codes. He lifted a lot of boxes, some as heavy as 50 pounds. The challenge wasn't so much the weight as that you couldn't really tell based on size whether a box was going to be heavy or not when you went to pick it up. Your body and your mind never knew what to expect. He wore a back brace for a while, but it would get so hot that he, would, that he felt like he was being cooked. His elbow tendonitis flared up. He often walked more than a dozen miles per shift, according to his Fitbit. He thought the device must be wrong and got a new pedometer, but it said the same thing. He put on a topical numbing cream before he went to work, took ibuprofen pills while he was at work, and when he got home, stood on ice packs, put ice on his elbow, and soaked his feet in Epsom salts. He switched shoes often to spread the impact across the sole. He made 1560 per hour, a fifth of what he was making at the tech job, and infinitely more than he was making unemployed. The warehouse in Thornton, 16 miles north of Denver, had opened just a year earlier in 2018. Its general manager, Clint Autry, was a seven-year veteran of the company who had already helped open several other facilities around the country. He'd even helped test the radio wave emitting vests that workers wore when they had to step near the path of the, quote, drive unit robots that carried around big tubs of merchandise to warn off their fully automated coworkers. Quote, the whole name of the game is getting the product to the customer in the quickest, most effective, cost-effective way based on shipping costs, Autry declared on a grand opening tour of the building. The ramp up at the warehouse started in mid-March of 2020, the same as everywhere around the, else around the country as the coronavirus lockdowns took hold. Orders soared to holiday levels as millions of Americans decided that the only safe way to shop was from their home. It was just nine months into Hector's time at the company, yet he was the only one who remained from his orientation class of 20. The others either hadn't been able to handle the pace or had gotten injured or had been terminated because they had run out of, ex of excused absences after getting injured. Now turnover climbed even higher than usual as many decided they couldn't handle the stress of the surge and the risk of the close quarters in the warehouse. As the number of workers dwindled, the pressure on those that remained rose. The company demanded that Hector work overtime, five 12 hour night shifts per week. With longer shifts and one less day of rest, the tendonitis got worse. He found out about his coworker with whom he worked closely every day, not from the company, but from other workers. The coworker, a man in his forties had stopped coming in and Hector assumed that he had simply drifted away like so many others. But then came word that he had the virus and that he'd been very sick. Hector relayed this to Laura and she got worried about the family, especially her elderly mother who lived with them and suffered from chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So Laura sent him to the basement. It was unfinished, but they set up a bed and got a little refrigerator and a microwave and a coffee maker. He snuck upstairs to use the bathroom. What bothered Laura was that they were figuring it all out on their own. Hector had gotten no notice about the coworker. He had gotten no information about how to respond to the risk of contagion. There was no 1-800 number to call. When she had gone online looking for any tips the company offered about how to deal with situations like this, all she found was the company's page touting everything it was as a corporation to deal with the crisis. Quote, they may be doing quite a bit, she said, but the company, quote, is also profiting every step along the way on the backs of their employees who are not being protected and neither are their families being protected. She couldn't help but feel some regret for having goaded Hector there in the first place. Quote, they call themselves a technology company, but it's really a sweatshop, she said. They have such a hold on our economy and our country. So I'll stop there. That's that's the that's those are the first three pages of fulfillment. Alec, I want to uh, kick off our conversation. You said you were focusing on regional inequality, which really <clears throat> leapt into prominence in 2016, though it's something you've been writing about for quite some time. And I'm wondering, you you said you chose Amazon as a frame, which those of us in the biz, you always know you need to set a story in a particular place or around a particular entity um, or person. And I'm wondering, is there something about Amazon that increases regional inequality in your mind? Absolutely. And that was, that's really kind of at the core of, of, of choosing that frame is the idea that, to put it very bluntly, and the, you have you have, these, you have these tech giants now that in various sectors of the economy, 
used to have, let's, let's start actually, I like to actually choose, start with the example of, of our industry, Nick, of, of the media, what's happened there. Ad, digital ad revenue is now the name of the game, right? We, our, our newspapers depend on ad revenue. And now it's mostly digital ad revenue that we, that we can hope to get. Um, ad revenue used to be, for the media, used to be spread all around the country and for newspapers, TV, radio. Now, digital ad revenue is the name of the game and 60% of all digital ad revenue flows to two companies, Google and Facebook. Um, and Amazon is actually getting a fairly large chunk in third place. But those two companies, Google, Google and Facebook, control 60% of all ad revenue, digital ad revenue. And so all that, all that revenue is kind of crude, but all that money just sort of used to be dispersed all around the country, now flowing to the Bay Area, where you now have just dystopian levels of, of, uh, of wealth and inequality. Similarly, in retail, retail, of course, it used to be everywhere, all the way from mom and pops up to department stores, regional department store chains. Um, and, and now, as we've shifted more and more to e-commerce, which last year we, of course, vastly intensified that shift, we have one company that now controls more than 40% of all e-commerce. Um, second place is Walmart, way down at 7%. So Amazon is at almost at half. And so just, again, think of all that, that sort of, that commerce, that business activity, that money that now essentially is just kind of hoovered into um, into the places where, where Amazon is based. You have Seattle now with 45,000 employees, Amazon employees in the city. Um, and again, just dystopian levels of, of wealth and, and inequality that have completely transformed that city. And, and now the same thing is about to happen in Washington, DC, the wealthiest city in the country um, that Amazon chose for its second headquarters. Um, because well, we can get into that later why they chose Washington. But the fact that you have a company choosing a place that's already expensive, already congested, but still wanting to go there. It's a classic example of sort of the rich get richer, winner take all effect of this tech economy now, where instead of going to a, say a St. Louis or a Baltimore or a Cleveland with a second headquarters where they could have had, you know, such cheaper land and, and just more space to sort of do their thing. Instead, you choose the place that's already rich and crowded and successful. And so that is the basic effect of what's been happening, um, how, the, how these giants have, are playing just a huge role in, in, in exacerbating these regional disparities. Now I'm curious, is this a function of Amazon being a successful tech company or is this a function of monopoly or both? It's both. It's, 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 and it's partly a function simply of the way that tech con the tech economy works, right? That there's something, um, about tech that has this, what they, the fancy word for it is an agglomerating effect where um, that, you, that encourages kind of this kind of winner take all regional effect. Back in the manufacturing era, once you had a given, you had a, an, some kind of innovation like say the, the steel making process, the best summer steel making process, you could go, go build steel mill anywhere you wanted. And as long as there was national resources and some basic manpower and transportation, um, now, but with the tech economy is different. There, the name of the game is it's all about human capital, right? The value lies entirely in, in the innovation itself. The, the production that fo follows from that is negligible in cost. Um, it's all about that, that innovation and software or apps or whatever it might be. And so you got to have that human capital and, and the human capital operates best in proximity, just the way that, you know, innovations throughout history have happened you know, in the city, in Renaissance Florence, in 19th century Glasgow. Um, and, and so you, you have a Silicon Valley because, because the innovation happens when you're together. And, and also when you're together with the capital, with the venture capital, so you can pitch your idea to the, to, to the guy who's gonna fund your startup. So there is that basic effect, the nature of tech. Um, and, but then on top of that, it has gotten, that, that effect has, has gotten much worse or much you know, greater because we have allowed the giants to get as big as we have, because our antitrust, post antitrust has, has gotten so lax um, over the last few decades that that has, you, you might've ended up with some more dispersal of, of these hubs if the giants, if each of these companies had not become so massively dominant as they, as they now are. Um, so it really is both the nature of this kind of work and this kind of economy and the fact that we've 
been so um, got so soft on Monopoly. Your book, and I got I recommend it highly to anyone who's tuned in. Order it through Tattered Cover. Um, your book goes into a lot of people's live stories all around the country, and um, you know ties them back to the thread, to the central thread of Amazon and regional inequality really nicely. And a lot of the book, unsurprisingly, is set in Seattle, which um, is a town which one of your characters, who's a kind of eccentric guy who became an artist there, um, Milo Duke, if I, yeah, Milo Duke, um, I think views it as having passed through three stages. When he moves there in the 70s, it's this kind of funky mm -hmm. town in a certain level of industrial distress. It's lost, even though Boeing's there, it's still lost a fair amount of jobs and it's relatively cheap sort of place artists, you know, tend to, to prosper in. And then of course, the book closes, he's leaving and it has become a playground for the super rich and home to, as you say, dystopian levels of inequality. What's interesting to me is that, it, and your book points out that during this time, it wasn't just Amazon. Seattle also was the birthplace of Microsoft and, and right. it was just bizarre that, and, and also not completely bizarre and not a complete coincidence that these two incredibly rich companies and two incredibly rich individuals based themselves there. And by the end, of course, uh, a lot of people are decrying the loss of the old Seattle, people are moving, um, Milo moves along with his uh, wife. And to me, the interesting thing was they moved to St. Louis, which yes. was a kind of a dying industrial, you know, a, a town that used to be bigger than Seattle, as you point out when they right. left, but now is kind of the dying industrial yes. place. I'm wondering what, what do you think the odds are that, that in another 50 years though, that somebody writes a book about St. Louis being the home of whatever company topples Amazon and it becomes the big playground for the rich. I mean, is this kind of a natural cycle in a way? You kind of needed that, you needed that low entry point in Seattle for Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos to move there. Does, does the regional inequality then eventually lead to entry for somebody else? I would love nothing more than that um, because I love St. Louis and and some of those cities that just really kind of grabs at me and breaks my heart when I go there for reporting stories and and it has such massive capacity now that's kind of that's going utterly unused and same with Baltimore and and Cleveland and all, all these other cities but I'm I'm no I'm not I'm not hopeful that hopeful that that might happen um, for starters the um, well. While the, the, while the initial move to, to Seattle by Microsoft was some was somewhat encouraged by by its you know sort of affordability and kind of accessibility at that point in time, the Bezos's coming there was already a feature of the winner take all thing in a sense because he was going there both to dodge taxes because going to Silicon Valley would have meant paying more set company having to assess sales taxes in California which didn't want to do but also because he knew that Microsoft was already in Seattle. So he was going to be able to draw on, on their, their workforce and, and the tech workforce that had kind of sprung up around them. And so that was already a very kind of early example of that winner take all effect. The, as for, you know, the, you know, the cycle of sort of history. Yes, we've always had, we have always had poorer and wealthier cities and regions, but but the sad thing is that right now those gaps are much bigger than, than, than they've been in a very long time, if ever. Just the way that the gaps have gotten so much bigger on the income scale between the 1% and the 99% and all that, the gaps between cities and regions have just gotten much bigger. And, and then finally, I, I would perhaps be more hopeful about that happening if, if there were more signs now of it starting to happen. And there was some hope that this was gonna happen coming out of the pandemic, right? Because we'd all be able to, to work from everywhere, anywhere, we we're, we're, we'd finally be able to do the remote work thing, and and so yes, I you know, I was hopeful that you'd see this big move to, um, to to the these hugely affordable, you know, beautiful old kind of industrial cities, and and it, that's just I, I've seen very little sign of that. And the people have been moving, yes, but they're moving from one winner take all city to a slightly more affordable one, the sort of San Francisco to Austin kind of move. Um, they're moving to the suburbs in their in their cities. So you, people are moving to the New York suburbs, wealthy New York suburbs, and they're moving to like pretty places. They're moving up to you know mountain resort towns or uh, or you know Boulder. I guess you know is, is one place that seems to be you know getting some some of that kind of moves, or you know to the coast of Maine or Hudson River towns. But 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 big moves to you know to Akron and Erie and Syracuse and and Dayton. Um, 
you know, I would love, I would love to see that those kind of green shoots, but, um, but it, I think certainly not many signs of them yet. The fact is that this year has actually been hardest in those cities because they had the least to fall back on. Um, so if you, when you knock out like the new restaurant district in St. Louis or Detroit, you knock out, it's that, that means a lot. Um, I have to ask uh, the, the news question of the day, which mm -hmm. is the, uh, the union vote in yeah. um, Bessemer, Alabama at an Amazon facility. Um, the initial tally <clears throat> seemed to not be going particularly well. It's, it's, no. it, you know, it's, it's hard to know the outcome of an election until all the ballots are counted, but the way they do these union elections, they usually release counts wow. in tranches and the, theoretically they're all shuffled. So if you've got a big trend, you should, you know, give you yes. an idea. And the union is, is doing poorly. I was just, I was curious about your thoughts on what's happening there and, and what the implications are. Yeah, I mean, I've, I have, you know, all these last couple of weeks I've been thinking a lot about this vote and, and, and talking quite a bit about it. And my general sense of it has been that the stakes were enormous um, because this was, was of course the first, the first actual election an actual full warehouse. And, and it was extraordinary, extraordinary that they had managed to, to get to that point in, in, in the deep South of all places um, but that, but that it was very clear that the odds were really long. I mean, and for several reasons, um, one of which is, you know, the main of which is it's just that Amazon has been, is of course so adept at 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 resisting um, organization and and has pulled out all the stops. One of the key things they've done, which I think hasn't got enough attention, is just that they were so successful in the early going at how this um, this election, this bargaining unit was defined, and Amazon defined it very broadly, which is. Okay. A classic employer, you know, sort of uh, strategy to it, the, the larger you make, you define the unit to include a lot of, um, well, a lot of people who you might actually think were supervisor types, um, for instance, uh, that the, that, that means that the union has to meet, meet a much higher bar to, to hit its 51%. It's the larger you grow that denominator, the more people they have to hit, uh, get yeses from to hit, hit a majority. And, and that's that's what happened in this case. There are there are there are people in the warehouses. There's a, a, a position called it's a quite of an Orwellian phrase, but it's called the process assistant. Um, and I came across them in one of my in the book because um, in one of the, the, these horrific fatal accidents I write about, the process assistant is sort of dry, riding this this woman to to, to get to produce more um, to bring more goods in on a forklift, and she's going too slow. He's riding her, and then she crashes and kills herself. Um, and those process assistants were eligible to vote in this election, even though they're essentially managers. And so that was just one way that the, that Amazon successfully kind of was able to, you know, tilt the playing field in its favor. And then secondly, I think it's just important to note that what you're also <coughs> against as, as a union there is, are the diminished expectations of workers. You know, a lot of workers, you, 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 if you read the coverage from, from Bessemer, a lot of the workers, you know, reporters would talk to them and they'd say, look, you know, it's a tough job. You know, it's not, the, I don't, I don't really like this job that much, but you know, it pays 15 bucks. Um, it's okay. You know, I'm not going to be here that long anyway. Like it's, it's a job, you know, and there's just the way in which these jobs have come, have in fact come to be seen as just something you're just doing for the time being. It's very transient. Um, it's better than nothing. Um, it's not something you're planning on building some kind of big career identity around. And so there's, there's just a, um, a, yeah, a diminishment of, ex of expectations that, that makes it hard for an organizer to say, look, you could get so much more out of this. Um, and, and I think that was also, that was also surely a factor. I'm sorry, I just muted yes, myself by yes, accident. Yes. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if we're going to go to some of the viewers' questions soon, but I was wondering, you know, one thing that I was really fascinated by, and as someone who's followed your work, um, you know, I was really interested at, at how you filled this book with so many people from so many different places. And, uh, you know, maybe you could share with us just, just how you found some of these people, how you chose the focus on certain ones. I mean, sure. I'm really struck, for example, I, you've done a lot of work in Dayton, but I was struck by the number of your characters from that part of Ohio who had 
you know, these roles at Amazon or brushing up against Amazon? I don't know if you went looking for them or no, into them or what. Definitely. No, I like talking about the, the, the characters because there's some that are, they're amazing people. And it just, it, a lot of it just came from my being out there a lot as a reporter and, and, you know, good things come when you're out there and, and one person leads to another. Um, you, actually the people, the, the artists you mentioned from Seattle, um, I met them just last year when I was in St. Louis reporting an article about dollar store violence. <laughs> and, and I was, and I was walk. I wanted to go to the Seattle. I did my reporting for that story, and I wanted to go check out the Seattle Symphony one night. And 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 they had a little art show gallery thing, you know, this little block of St. Louis where they're trying to bring back galleries. And I went into this gallery for ten minutes, and I bumped into this couple, and I got talking, and they'd come from Seattle. And I thought, wow. And we, and and next thing you know, they're in the book. I mean, when you're out there, good things happen. But the but the man you refer to in, in Dayton, also just incredible serendipity. I was in. Dayton reporting uh, for a this frontline documentary about Dayton, that sort of a classic left behind city. And um, we found the team, uh, the team, the frontline team found a family living in a shelter in Dayton um, who were striking for a number of reasons, one of which was that they that he had a job and and he had a job making cardboard, um, making cardboard boxes, and 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 yet they were living in the shelter and 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 it was just as I was starting to think about this book, this possible Amazon frame, and we're, we, I was driving him back to his shelter that night, the men's shelter, and for leaving his family in the family shelter. And, and I said, wait a second, Todd, do you, who do you guys make boxes for? Like, and he said, oh, all different companies. And, and I said, well, which, you know, like which ones? And he said, well, we're not really supposed to talk about it, but you know. And I said, well, does it, include like a company that uses a lot of boxes that I'm like thinking of, of, you know, that sort of obvious big cardboard company. And he said, yeah, of course it does. And, and, and so from there, that was, so now there was this, this, this really fascinating, heartbreaking family um, at the bottom, sort of of this vast supply chain ecosystem um, that leads all the way up to, to, to the billionaire uh, in Seattle. And, so so, of it, so much of it really just comes from from just getting out there as much as you possibly can, and and it's amazing what you find. This is so fascinating. I could just let you guys go on for like thirty more minutes because it, being a part of a you know small business that I. I've loved since I was a kid. It's just so important to hear about. Um, so we want to go to audience Q&A. Um, and so if anybody has any questions on the chat that you're watching us on, or the screen that you're watching us on, there's a chat next to the window. Um, and so you can ask questions. One asked, was asked early on, of, does the book address efforts on behalf of small businesses that are at risk because of Amazon's monopoly practices? Yes, it absolutely does. As a whole, uh, big crucial chapter devoted to the small businesses and and um, because that's such a big part of of what's been happening and I focus that part of the story on El Paso and on on, on a group of office supply dealers in El Paso it's basically the the Dunder Mifflins of, of El Paso they're exactly those kind of companies with um, you know about 12 15 employees um, they do exactly what they do on the show they sell office paper and other office supplies to local businesses and uh, government and school districts. And, and what they've been up against these last few years, few years is that Amazon has come in and has persuaded a lot of their customers, the government, city government, school districts, to simply buy everything they need from Amazon because it's easier, right? It's just one click. And, and, and they assure the, 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 local, the, the local government and businesses, look, you can still buy from your local office supply dealers. We'll, we'll, we'll mark them as local, you know, uh, local local companies on the site. Um, and then they go to the local off supply dealers and say, hey, just come to the marketplace. It'll all just be easier there. And you can sell to the whole world, right? Um, not just your local clients, you'll sell to anyone. And it's, it's every, you know, it'll be great for everyone. And what's left out of that, of course, is that Amazon now and acting as that middleman exacts a, a, a cut of 15, at least 15%, you know, up to 30%. Um, and, and and there's this enormous pressure on those businesses to come to just like just kind of give up and go join the marketplace because everybody's doing it. That's where it, that's where it's all happening. So you better do it or you're going to get left out. And I actually managed to sneak into well, I 
yeah, I got into a session where, where the company was, these big executives from Seattle were, were, had a captive audience with a lot of these office supply dealers and were pressuring them to, um, to just to come on board. And it was fascinating to watch how that, how that happened. So I, and I scribe it all in the book, um, you know, verbatim, sort of how they were making that, that push. This question has to do with the political side of things, which I think, Nick, you can chime in as you will. But is there anything that on the policy side that can be done to help stop um, what's happening here with the monopolies? And, and what is, is there a role essentially in the government, I think, that they're asking and in policy that could be done? Sure, I'll, I'll take the first crack at that. And maybe Nick wants to see, I'm curious what he thinks about it. I mean, the book is not a solutions book. It's not an argument book or policy book, but it definitely leaves one with the implicit impression that one big thing we can do to deal with, with this re these regional disparities is to, to get more serious about antitrust. That, that because regional concentration of wealth is tied to market concentration, that if you disperse uh, these giants somehow or somehow break them up, somehow rein them in, that it will help this problem to some degree. And, and I do believe that there's actual, I, I, I do believe the prospects for action on that front are probably better than for organizing at this, right now at this moment, um, that there are signs that the Biden administration is gonna be serious on this front and, and basically to br and breaking somewhat with the Obama administration's lax approach. And just through some of the appointments they've made so far um, and, and things are saying, and, and the fact that crucially that Republicans are not totally opposed to this such an effort themselves. They have their own motivations for distrusting big tech, but they are, it's, it's not out of the question that you could actually have some kind of possible consensus on this score. So it's gonna be really fascinating to watch this fight playing out. It's essentially, it's, it's essentially a fight within the democratic party, within the left between the party's general pro sort of pro Silicon, Silicon Valley orientation, getting a lot of money from, from big tech, lots of revolving door, people going back and forth. Democrats in general as consumers and voters are pretty pro Amazon or sort of Amazon's biggest uh, market in a sense. Um, but so within that sort of pro tech, big tech affiliation, you now have voices like Elizabeth Warren and others who are, um, who are trying to chart a different path. And, and so watching that fight within the left on this, on this issue is going to be really interesting. Yeah, I think yeah. Alec, Alec addressed it pretty well there. I would yeah. the one thing I'd add is that I do think there's there's there are limited tools the government has outside of of antitrust, right? Of right. of breaking up these big tech companies. I mean, they, they can't require that Amazon put HQ three in Dayton or anything like that. Right. Um, the real question is if we actually get to that point where they do take action, and this could take some time. Then when we go down the road, do a thousand flowers bloom or do you just have a slightly smaller version of what you have now where there are more, you know, where the agglomeration effects that Alec pointed to continue to happen and the winner take all cities continue to take all the new money and the new businesses and nobody's opening their new, uh, you know, internet startup in Dayton. Right. And, you know, I, I don't, I don't think we'll know that till we get there. And if that is the case, it, it's, it, it will be quite hard yeah. um, for you know, the government to remedy that when, when, the, when, when the market, as it were, has said so definitively, screw it, we're not interested in this place or in this entire swath of the country. We're not interested in investing at all. It's just really hard for the government to, to counter that and you know let's just hope we don't get to that point right um, but you know. yeah it's true absolutely i i'm curious too i want to change a bit about the conversation to the book itself of why a book what did you what could a book how could a book tell this story better or differently than an article or newsreel or something like that and and i'm curious too nick on and when reading it what you also believe um that this book did and could do differently than maybe an article or something um, in the press. And, and Alec, I'm curious about your motivations behind why a book? I, I think because I just, I, 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 I work mostly in magazine articles. That's my, usually my usual, my usual scale. And I've been coming, coming at this sort of in, in certain articles that I've done 
where I definitely was nibbling at the issue, but I just knew that it was such a big subject, literally like because it encompassed the whole country and that somehow you were gonna have to be able to spend a serious amount of time in a certain number of places. And what I ended up with are mainly mainly four main places, the two winter cities of, of DC and Seattle and the two left behind places of Baltimore and, and Ohio are my main places. But um, I just knew that, and I also knew that I wanted to really be able to get into people's lives and just into, into the stories of, of places and, 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 and certain people and, and, and really to be able to do the full narrative nonfiction approach. And, 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 and that, that I wanted it to be, yeah, I definitely wanted to have a certain heft and, ha and, and to be able to just be a real sweeping kind of story of, of the country in our times. And that my, my, my main, it's one of my main models, it's not surprising, was, was The Unwinding, the George Packer book that came out in, in the Great Recession years. And, um, and so it was, it was so, just as he had kind of gone deep into lives in certain places around the country, I wanted to also, but, but with that sort of regional inequality, big tech frame. And, and what do you think as the reader, what this book did for you differently than maybe an article would have? Um, in that sense. It's interesting because I, I kind of, at this point, when I read uh, a nonfiction, a work of nonfiction, be it a, a book or something shorter, a magazine article, or even a news article, I kind of read it as a professional in a way. And so I'm kind of, when I read an article, a lot of the time I think, I wonder what else is here. Or I wonder what else, you know, what has had to be cut. Cause I know it's, it's brutal. It's like, you know, it's like committing surgery on yourself when you've reported something and you've got to cut to the length. Um, and when, you know, when you read a book and when I read something like this, you know, you know that there's space, there's never space for everything, right? I'm sure I could have put a whole another book on top of this one, but that's why we have editors. Um, but when you read a book like this, you have, first of all, you kind of have time as a reader to ingest all the information. Um, you know, it's not, in an article, usually, Lord knows in my articles, it's really compacted and shoved directly in your face. I'm writing very short pieces. In a magazine article, it's still relatively compacted. You're gonna have a couple of, you know, okay, here's the section where we have to pull back and we have to have a little narrative explanation. Okay, quick, get back to a scene, get back to a... And in a book like this, you really have time to go through a chapter, have a few pages of explanation, and then really immerse yourself in scenes and in people's lives, and then also get into, if you want to get into paragraphs of information or data or policy discussions, it's there. I mean, you just have more space as a reader, and, you know, I imagine as a writer, too, you just have so much more space, and because of that, you can convey a lot more, and you also, in a way, again, it's, it's easier to um, ingest as a reader. A book, I think, is a lot easier than a really meaty magazine article can sometimes be like, you know, just to extend the metaphor, I guess, you know, like just, just gorging a little too much at your neighbor at Churrascaria or something. I don't know. Um, you know, you just, you just get too much information. The, and, and Alec does a great job in this book. He paces it. He, he chunks it out into chapters. He, he moves back and forth between locations. You never get tired of being with one person because he can come, if he's got more material, he can, come back to that personal later chapter. And yeah. I, I just think that's a great, that's a great thing. And he, he does it very nicely in this book. He, he does very, very much so. And uh, so I wanna ask two more questions before we end here this evening. But Alec, um, this one's really interesting to me. You said you wrote many an article about this topic, but when did this interest really spark for you? When did it start or where did it start? I, I think, you know what I think, what, I mentioned already two of the sources. One was kind of growing up in a struggling, you know, small industrial town in, in Western Mass and watching it kind of fall behind Boston. And then, and then I, you know, I described being in DC and going out to the Midwest as a political reporter in the early Obama years. But I think what really made me want to take on was the, the third um, contrast that I felt, which was when I moved, moved back to Baltimore um, with my family in 2013, eight years ago. And, and watching the gap between Baltimore and Washington, watching that gap, these two cities just 40 miles apart, growing wider and wider to the point where they're just, just you, won't, you really feel like a drop in atmospheric pressure when you move between them. And, and I get almost kind of dizzy when I go down to Washington now, just the, 
the, the extraordinary gap in prosperity and prospects. Um, and it was really that, that's what I felt that so viscerally and I got so really kind of angry about it in a way. And it felt so wrong to me in a lot of ways. The fact that we were like knocking down hundreds of houses in Baltimore um, and just down the road, while just down the road, people are suffering, struggling to pay seven, eight, nine hundred thousand dollars for the exact same kind of houses. That to me is insane. And it talks, suggests something that's completely out of whack in our country. And so it was really that contrast that made me want to take this on. No, and, and thank you for that honesty, that's really great to hear. And it's, it's, it's shown in your book with how personal you have the book, but not just for you, but the empathy that you feel for the other characters. Sometimes it's hard to call them characters because they're real people, you know, and real stories, but for the characters that you give us in the book. Um, so we thank you for that. We at Tatter Cover like to end on this question here. So interpret it as you will. And it is for both of you for Nick, for you as a reader of this book and Alec for you as the writer, but what did this book fulfillment teach you? And, and Nick, I'd love it if you could start and we'll end with our author of the hour. Um, what did it teach me? Uh, I think it, it taught me that even though I'm a cynical reporter and I kind of had a cursory knowledge and belief of ways that Amazon had permeated our entire economic system and, and helped rig it for itself. It taught me that I, I don't know the half of it. I mean, there's, there's tons of examples like the one that he gave um, in the, the, the um, office supply world, which are really eye-opening. And um, just the way that they, um, you know, the way that they work with really kind of squeeze economic development people and local county offices the, the ways that they, you know, structure how they do their warehousing. I mean, it, there, there's a lot of, of, of stuff in there that, um, you know, I think when I think of what I've learned from a nonfiction book, I usually think of, of the, of kind of the, the eat your vegetables part, like that stuff. And I learned a ton on that, but I mean, it's also, it's just, it was just a great read. I mean, that was also, you know, I, I like I said, I've, I've followed Alex's work for a while, and so I, I wasn't really shocked to see this. But he's got a great ability to combine, um, to, to to combine that with really human um, and and fascinating historical stuff. And so, you know, the combination was very compelling, and, and that was my my big takeaway from it. And Alec. Um, I would say two, uh, two things. First of all, the book, this book really kind of taught me how to write a book. I, this is my first real, my first real book. Uh, I, I wrote a short biography of Mitch McConnell, but that was like, like a half book. It was 45,000 words. It was initially just, just an ebook. And um, this was the first true big doorstop hardcover book that I wrote. And so it taught me how to do it by doing. And, and, and it uh, taught me that I can do it. Um, and, I, and I'm very excited to do the next ones. I, it, yeah, as far as actual sort of learning, I would say what I learned most from the book was probably all the extraordinary history that I had to ingest to, for all the various chapters. I learned so much more about like, the city I live in, Baltimore, through, the, through all my time in the, in the archives at the, at the library and just learning about this astonishing history of this of this place, Sparrows Point, that's gone from being the biggest steelworks in the world to now being a business park with Amazon warehouses and just being blown away by things I was embarrassed not to know about this place that was just down the road for me. And then, but also about black history of Seattle and all these other bits, these areas of history that I go deep into in the book that for me was all, all new and, and all fascinating. Well, it was new and fascinating for us too. And thank you for being the channel with which we get to read and experience these stories as well. Um, and I'm excited to hear that there's more new projects on the line. Hopefully you'll be able to come to Denver and we'll do a, a, an in-person book signing for you um, when those works come out. Nick, if you ever feel the whim to write a book, we'll take you as well. We would happily <laughs> do that um, with your reporting and knowledge prowess. Um, I wanna thank you both for being here tonight. I wanna thank our audience members for joining us and asking great questions as well. Um, I wanna give each of you a chance to remind people who you are, where they can find you online and anything else you wanna say before the evening is out. And Nick, again, we'll start with you and then end with Alec McGillis. Okay, I'm Nick Riccardi. I'm actually based here in Denver. I've been here for 
almost 16 years now, terrifyingly, as a um, national reporter, first for the Los Angeles Times, and now basically writing politics for the Associated Press um, out of Denver, covering, specializing in the West, but writing all sorts of stuff. And you can find me more than my editors would probably like on Twitter. I'm pretty active there. <laughs> well, I'm glad, you're, I'm glad you're there, Nick, because that's how we met. So um, don't, please don't leave. Um, and I'm also on Twitter more than my editors would probably like. And so you can find me there. And, but I am, uh, yes, normally in Baltimore and, uh, and I'm, uh, what else can I say? I'm so grateful to, to, you know, to Nick for, for joining tonight. Some just really good, good challenging questions and so grateful to, to Tattered Cover for, for hosting this. And I just, this, um, this the, the book, there's a, the bookstore here in Baltimore, in Baltimore, when, they, when the book first came out, they, they put a stack of the books Next to the register, um, and that very first day, and it was so nice to see. And, and they put a little, the owner put a little note next to it that said, "Please read this book. This is our world." Um, and it just like that really just kind of hit me hard. And because she, she's right, like that this is now our world. And so um, I really do hope that as many of you as possible do do get a chance to 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 get it either at the Ivy Bookstore in Baltimore, where, where that note was posted, but but tonight, more importantly, at Tattered Cover. And so really thank you to all the independent bookstores out there that have been such champions of the book. And um, this, this, this is our world. So it is, you. it is. And I love that idea. I'm gonna freaking steal it um, <laughs> about what she said about it. Yeah. And, and, you know, honestly, when one of us succeeds the boat, you know, what is yes. that phrase about the boat, right? Water rises, all the boats right. rise or something like that. Yes. And that's true when it comes to indies. So we're happy um, that you're supporting your local independent bookstore in Baltimore and, you know, in Denver for, for yes. Nick, it's Tattered Cover. And we thank you all for doing that. Um, maybe shopping at a local mom and pop restaurant for dinner tomorrow. Uh, we wouldn't be here for the last 50 years or the last year without you. So thank you for what you do in our communities and thank you both for being here tonight. If you'll stick around while I finish closing us out here, you can get Alec McGillis's new book, Fulfillment, at tattercover.com or at any one of our locations. We really encourage you to read it. Um, it's eye-opening, informative, and uh, a little too dystopian, a little too true for our liking at this moment, but it's necessary. So thank you all again. We encourage you to shop locally, get, that, get Fulfillment online today. Uh, stay safe, everybody. Happy reading. Thank you all. Thank you. And we're out. All right. All right. Thanks so much.